Hi, I'm Ed Amundsen. I'm the pastor here at High Street Baptist Church. We are so glad that you tuned in to worship with us today. And as you do, our hope is that you will hear from God through the reading of the word and that you will participate in the worship of God uh, from the comfort of your computer, wherever you may be, or your handheld device. As we go throughout the service, our hope is, is that you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if you've never done so before. And if you already are a believer, we hope that you will deepen your relationship with Christ as a result of this worship service. Uh, thank you for tuning in. You may want more information on how you can get engaged uh, more deeply with the church. And if that's the case, you'll notice down here on the screen is our church information. You can call us or you can go to our website at www.highstreetsomerset, and as you can tell, that's all spelled out, dot O-R-G. Uh, that website is also open to secure electronic giving, and you can do that simply by clicking on the menu icon at the top portion of the screen. The menu will click down and you'll see give. You can click on that if you'd like to donate. Other than that, God bless you for being here. We hope that it will be a joyous time. And now let's get ready to worship. Good evening, High Street family. I want to welcome you into our evening worship services tonight. Whether you are here in the room with us or whether you are joining us online, we want to say welcome to you. We are glad that you are here. Um, if you are here in the room with us, hopefully on your way in, you picked up a communion cup. Um, if you did not get one of those, uh, just raise your hand real quick and one of the deacons will find you and bring you one. Uh, but um, hopefully you picked that up. We will use that at the end of the service tonight so we'll, we'll we will observe the lord's supper together at towards the end of of the service a couple of announcements to uh, uh make you aware of tonight um number one next sunday night we'll have a, a special call business meeting uh just got a a, a brief a couple of items that we want to bring to you um so that'll be next sunday night also next sunday i told you this morning um about the love offering that we are collecting for for tommy floyd to help with uh uh, medical bill. Um, so if you have any questions, I won't rehash all of that uh, tonight, but if you have any questions about um, any of that, uh, you can come see me or you can uh, call the church office. We'll be glad to, to answer those questions for you. But just wanted you to know so that you'd be prepared um, if you would like to to give uh, to that uh, next week. If you want to write a check, you write it to High Street, put the, what it's for, uh, Tommy Floyd uh, love offering in the memo line. That way we'll know what it goes for. Um, or you can bring uh, code hard cash. That works just as well, too. Okay, a um, couple of other things. February 3rd and 4th, mi third and fourth men, uh, don't forget to sign up for our men's conference. Just to be clear, uh, I think I said this this morning, but if you have looked at those two dates and you said, you know what, I can't be here on Friday night, but I could on Saturday, or I can't be on here on Saturday, but I can be here on Friday night, we want you to come uh, for whichever... We, we pre preferably we would like to have you for both, uh, but if you can't be here for both, come when you can um, and register and let us know in that registration form. It'll you will be able to tell to check uh, Friday, uh, Saturday, Friday only, Saturday only, or both 
Um, that way we'll know. Um, but anyway, go ahead and sign up for that. We would uh, we need to get uh, some good solid numbers for that. So uh, that's coming up on the third and fourth. And then, um, of course, um, we've got the um, Wednesday night classes that are still ongoing. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of module one, but you can still come out and be a part of one of those if you would like. Um, and then um, a little bit further on, XYZ um, dates are in uh, the bulletin for February, uh, which include their normal luncheon, um, includes the game day, and then there's also a special trip to um, to a play in Russell Springs. Is that right? Um, and so there's a sign-up sheet back in the back for that if you would like to go uh, to that. And then uh, on February 10th, the marriage ministry is having their uh, Valentine's dinner, and I didn't bring that information up here, but it's at Serendipity, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back. If you have any questions, you can ask uh, Cass or Stephanie Payne. They'll be glad to answer those for you. All right, that's enough announcements. If you've got a Bible, let me invite you to grab it and turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. When you find your place there, let me invite you to stand with us in honor of the God that we serve and his written word. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord says to us this evening. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond to it by lifting our voices in song as we sing together. My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. For me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. Well, it's good to see you tonight as we are preparing for the Lord's Supper. Let me encourage you to take this time that we have during and throughout the service to think about your, your life before the Lord, uh, to invite the Holy Spirit to examine you and to bring forward anything that you may need to confess or repent of uh, in a way of preparation. I want to say thank you once again 
for your tithes and offerings. And uh, sometimes we don't always get to see the benefit of what that does for us. But tonight, when you put your hand in your pocket or wherever you have it, and you pull out that little packet, that's just one way that your generosity goes to help us to serve and worship the Lord. And that's just one small thing, but it's a big thing. Because when we do the Lord's Supper, it is no small thing. So remember that missions and ministry is what we do. It's the name of everything we're called to. Uh, today, I wanted to correct a number I gave you today. I said that there were 24 in the Hispanic worship. There were 25. I shortchanged them one. So we don't want to do that. That's one quarter of 100, folks. They are on fire over there. So uh, I met him as they came down out of the staircase today and just beaming. I mean, Brother Richard was walking two inches above the carpet. And uh, praise the Lord for that. It's just a wonderful thing to see. So uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, one of the things that the deacons will be bringing next Sunday, uh, or actually the only thing they're going to bring is uh, that we have been asked and called upon to ordain Brother Richard, and we'll bring it to you for your consideration. So uh, prayers appreciated this week. Uh, pray in your heart and ask the Lord what he would have you to do. Um, there's a beautiful quilt on display in the foyer area. If you go out there, it is the marriage ministry shirts throughout all the years that we've been doing shirts and it's all made, every shirt, into a quilt. It is beautiful. The pattern is little hearts. And uh, there are so many years represented there. So this would be a great time for you if you have a chance on your way out to take a look at it. The quilt was made for us by Tammy Muse at the request of Miss Stephanie Payne. And Miss Tammy Muse has outdone herself. It is a gorgeous quilt. You'll hear a little bit more about that. That quilt's going to come back up uh, toward the end of the year. But for right now, just take a look at it when you get a chance. I did get a report on Brother Jeremy. Uh, as we were coming into service, his procedure was concluded. And so uh, he is in recovery. Uh, Angie said he is recovering well. They're going to keep him overnight for observation. Uh, very thankful for how the church family sprung into action. Several of you contacted them and offered. Um, and I believe it was Vicki Hughes who went over and took care of the kids. And so thank you for being that kind of congregation. And don't forget, as we pray for Brother Jeremy tonight, we're going to continue to pray for all of those on the list. We're going to continue to pray for Miss Cheryl, Mr. Silas, for Ray Brandon. Uh, Ray's got a real conundrum. He takes those shots in his eyes to keep his vision clear, but he can't take those shots if he has a heart stent. And so he has some choices to make. Hopefully, they're going to be able to give him the shot for his eyes the 15th of this month and then the stent after that. But in future uh, kind of shots, he really needs those. And for those of you who think shots in the eyes are the most excruciating thing, I agree. Um, but nonetheless, Brother Brandon just really depends on those. So be in prayer for him. And uh, then tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, don't forget, we're going to be walking around the shoemaker's house. Now, it's very careful. We're going to pray for Cheryl and her treatments that she's strengthened and healed. Don't walk around quiet seven times and then somebody blow a horn and their walls fall down. Okay, we don't want to do that. It's a little... Uh, thing back to Jericho. Those of you who are biblical should know that. We're going to be reading about that soon. All right. Don't blow the horn seven times and the walls fall down. Pray uh, for healing. Uh, maybe you have an unspoken prayer request tonight you want to indicate by the uplifted hand. All right. God knows the need. As always, if you want to come forward tonight in preparation for the Lord's Supper, you may do so. Let's bring all of our offerings and our prayers and our requests and our praises to the Lord together. Tonight, Father, we are just honored to gather as your body, your people, to say thank you, Father. Thank you for who you are, to praise you for what you've done. And Father, to admit to you, to confess to you our sin. Our sin, Lord, as David said, which is ever before you and in front of your face. And as David said, though we sin against many 
people in many different ways. Our sin is against you and you only, for you are a holy God. So tonight as we come, God, whether the sin is deeply, deeply hidden and one that we have tried to hide and tried to pretend doesn't exist, or whether our sin has bubbled over into a moral earthquake and it's for everyone to see, or somewhere in between. Help us, Lord, to open the deepest, darkest recesses of our soul to you and say simply, Lord, search my heart and try me and see if there is any way in me that is a displeasure to you and bring it to my attention. For tonight we confess our sins in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for answering these prayers and preparing our hearts. We believe by faith in advance that, Father, we will receive all that we need and more because we have the assurance from your word. And so, Father, we thank you. We give you the glory and the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand with us again as we continue to sing and worship together. see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers only with the power of his promises of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls. By faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw the king. When the long for Messiah would appear. With the power to break the chains of sin and death. And arise triumphant. The church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the laws to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him. Our faith and not by sight. We'll walk by 
by faith and not by sight. Father, we thank you so much for this time that you have given us this evening to be able to gather around your word and to lift up our voices in song and praise to you for all that you have accomplished for us. Father, to gather around your word, to study it, to see what we can learn and can glean from it. Father, we just pray that you would teach us tonight according to your Holy Spirit what you would have us to know. And then, Father, to be able to gather around your table and to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper together again uh, in just a few moments. Father, what a joy and what a privilege um, it is for us to be together tonight. So, Father, we pray that you would continue to bless all that remains of this service. Pray that you would use it, that you would speak to us, and that you would help us to apply those things to our hearts so that we may see and know your goodness evermore, day by day by day. Father, we love you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may. Well, tonight I'm fully aware that we are way behind where we're reading in Scripture. In fact, in Scripture, uh, we have already made it with the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. So we hope that you're reading with the Read Scripture app. Uh, Just some exciting days ahead as the children of Israel marching to the promised land. So, uh, but why are we lagging behind? Because there's a few folks in the Old Testament that we really need to stop and take a look at. And I promise we're going to catch up very soon. But one of those people we have to look at is Abraham. Because the lesson that Abraham teaches us is so very, very important. Particularly tonight. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you know what the number one requirement of taking the Lord's Supper is? The number one requirement, that's faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. This is the single most important element of the Lord's Supper. And faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is so important because we know the Lord's Supper is a reenactment of the sacrifice of Jesus' body and the shedding of his blood for our salvation. And it's so important that when we do this enactment together, it is not only a memorial, as the Apostle Paul says, as we look backward to what Christ has accomplished, which is, by the way, and that's a sermon for another night, connected to the Exodus, But more importantly, it's a promise until we are with the Lord and we drink of the fruit of the vine with him anew in the Father's kingdom. And so this is such an important thing. But I want you to understand the Lord's Supper is only for and only applies to those with true biblical saving faith. And so tonight, if that's you, if you're a person who's put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and you've been uh, baptized by believers baptism we want you to join us church member or not for this is the work of the body of Jesus Christ but it is a work of true biblical faith and that's the title of the sermon tonight true biblical faith we're going to see that definition come alive in Abraham as we look back to Genesis chapter 12 and in the calling out of Abram We see in these first three verses all that we need to find about faith and what it means to us. So we return to the verses that Brother uh, Brandon so lovingly uh, read with us. And let's return there and read them one more time. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses writes, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
And so as we open up this calling experience of Abram, we say, well, where's that definition of biblical faith? Well, I want you to see it in three parts. Number one, I want you to see the source of true biblical faith. In verse one, it says, now the Lord said, I want to pause there. Why? Because there is the source of true biblical faith. You see, when Joshua recounts Abram and his family in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, he says specifically that when Abram and his father Terah and all of them lived on the other side of the Euphrates, that he served idols. In other words, before God stepped into Abram's life, Abram was an idolater. He had household gods. He worshipped all kinds of different gods, just like all of the residents of Ur of Chaldees, where he was from. Something changed in Abram's life that introduced him to saving biblical faith. And I want to see that because Abraham might be known as the father of our faith, but it's apparent he is not the source of our faith. Our faith comes from somewhere Else, Where does it come from? Well, we know for sure then, if that's the case, the source of all biblical faith is not human will. And I want to illustrate this just by simply going back one chapter in the Bible. Go back to chapter 11. And I think it's fitting that we say chapter 11. Chapter 11 in the United States of America is one of the bankruptcy chapters that you can file. And certainly chapter 11 of Genesis is a bankruptcy chapter. What's happening here? Well, what we're seeing in chapter 11 is the events that surround the Tower of Babel. And I want you to notice how it describes what happened there. Verses 1 and 2. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. Now watch what happens in verse 3. And they said one to another, come, let us. Now, if you were a person who had a pen in hand and a Bible in hand, I would say, underline that phrase, come, let us. But I do want you to mark it in your mind. Come, let us. And I want us to count how many times that phrase or some similarity to it is spoken in this passage. That's one. Continue reading, verses 3 and 4. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Verse 4. Then they said, come, let us. There it is again. Underline the word us again. And then they said, build ourselves. Now, that word ourselves in the Hebrew is the same word us. So just as a mental note, mark that one as well. Underscore the word uh, us and ourselves. All right, again in verse 4, a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let who? Let us uh, name, get a name for ourselves. Once again, when you underscore the word us, go and underscore that where it says a name for ourselves. Again, same word as us. Now, when you go back and look at all the us's that you identified, what do you see? You see us, 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 right? And what are you seeing here? You are seeing man's will at work. Now here's what happened. This, these are the, the children and descendants of Noah. And God told Noah and all of his family to spread across the face of the earth and multiply and take dominion. Yet these ancestors just went a few miles from where the ark had parked and they decided to congregate and build a city. They are in disobedience to the word of God. And as a result, what you hear is, uh, let us, let us, let us, me, 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 my, my, my. This is man's attempt at establishing his own kingdom in rebellion against God's kingdom. Now, let's go back to chapter 12. Let's compare and contrast. We got let us, let us, 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 us. Okay. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Notice the difference. God says to Abraham, Go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land what? I will show you. 
Verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation and what? I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless those who curse you and him who dishonors you what? I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what it boils down to is we have a clear example of man's will. We have a clear example of God's will. Man's will says, let us. God's will says, I will. So you see, faith is not rooted in man's let us. It doesn't come from man's will. Faith is rooted in God's, I will, I will do this. And so you can find true faith in the outcomes that we see in chapter 11 and chapter 12. What's the true outcome of chapter 11? Well, verse 4, the people in uh, Babel were trying to build a tower to the heavens to make themselves a name. and, And did it work? No, the outcome was God came down confused their language, and scattered the people. Man's will always ends in confounding and confusion. But what about God's will? What about what happened at the end of Abram's story? Here's the thing. Abram was blessed. He said, I will give you a name in Genesis 12, verse 2. You know, nobody remembers anybody's name from Babel. Maybe Nimrod, the the city mayor, (laughs) Nimrod, you probably, a lot of you, unless you're, I know there's several of you that are Bible readers, so you would have said, now, Brother Ed, don't you tell me I didn't know Nimrod. I know Nimrod. I've called my brother or sister that a few times. I know the word Nimrod. Okay, you knew Nimrod, but for the rest of us, maybe we were like, oh, Nimrod, that was one of those complicated words we read through. Uh, I just didn't pick it up. And some of you might be like, Nim who? (laughs) Nim what? Okay, very few people know Nimrod's name. Nobody else from Babel is known. But who knows about Abraham? (laughs) Here we are 4,000 years later, and everybody across the globe The globe still knows Abraham's name. The Muslims know Abraham. The Buddhists know Abraham. The Christians know Abraham. Why is that? It's because man said, let us make a name for ourselves, and he failed because that's his will. But God said, I will make a name for you, Abraham, and he succeeded because that's God's will. So we see illustrated in the scripture that faith especially Faith that gets the job done. I don't know about you, but I don't have time for any other kind of faith. I want the faith that gets the job done. I want to see that it doesn't find its source in human will. It finds its source in the will of God. It's very important to understand because today we have quite a few Tower of Babel mentality Christians. People who try to make a name for themselves rather than submitting to the will of God, rather than looking at saying, God, what is your will for my life? They say, what is my life for your will? And so they, and rather than submit, they want to make a name for themselves. They want to name what they want. They want to claim what they want. They want to build a bigger empire for themselves. And so they're Babel-minded babies. And you don't do that. When you read God's word, you put your faith in what God says so that faith is not rooted in human will and what I want to happen or what I see happening. We we root our faith in the word of God and what God says. So the source of all biblical faith is not human will or wisdom. Look again, if you will, at verse 1. Go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land I will show you. So Abraham is a pagan who suddenly has an encounter with the living God. He's a pagan, we know that, and we know that he is living in a pagan land. He is living in Haran. It's a pagan land. And so he's a pagan living in a pagan land. He's 75 years old. What's that got to do with anything? Well, when God called him out, He was 75 years old. That's an important part of the story. Why? 
Conventional wisdom in the 21st century tells us that young people have all of the energy, all of the creativity. They have all of the motivation and drive, strong bodies, strong minds. If today's muckety-mucks were in charge of the Abrahamic story, why Abraham wouldn't have been 75, he'd have been 25. But that's not how it works. By selecting Abram at 75, we know at least three things about God. Number one, because Abram was a pagan at 75, we know that God, uh, to him, there's no one who is too far gone to put their faith in God. Maybe you're here tonight, you say, man, I have been around the world and back in the realm of sin. I am so wicked, God could never forgive me. I remind you, Abraham had 75 years of pagan worship and not one minute of godly worship and God called him and he responded by faith and God saved him. By his faith. That's what Hebrews says. He was saved by faith. So right here we say there's no place that's too far. No matter where you're at tonight. All you need to do is turn and say, yes, Lord, here I am. Now, we learned that. Number two, what we learn is by selecting Abram at 75, we know that there is no one alive today that is too old to be used by God. See, you might say, I'm too young to be used by God. And that's, there are certainly some children who are too young to be used in certain ways because they lack what? Saving faith. But we have come to believe in the 21st century that there are people too old to serve God. Well, my body isn't what it used to be. My mind isn't as crisp as it once was. Or, or my favorite, I've done my duty. Now it's time for the young people to do their duty. Listen, Abram is 75 years old. That tells us no one is ever too old to be used by God. You're not too old. And more importantly, third, by selecting Abram at 75, we also know that God wants people who know they can't do it without him. If he would have selected a 25-year-old, that 25-year-old would be raring, getting out ahead of him, trying to do stuff in his own power and his own strength. He'd say, I've got energy for days. God, I've got some ideas. Let me share with you my ideas. And God would say, now, wait a minute. i got some. No, no, God, just forget that. Listen, I think we should do this. And God would say, now, now Abram, would you say, and, no, God, we got to go here right now. we got to go. And God would say, my goodness, what have I done? 25-year-old won't sit down and be quiet. And he thinks he can do everything without me. But no, one of the first things that is important in faith is, really, is realizing God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's not about me achieving something to the point where I please God. It's about God in his mercy and his unmerited favor reaching down and engaging me for no other reason than it pleases him to do so. I want you to notice faith starts with God's word to man, and true faith results in man's obedience to God. That's how you know it's true. If God brings his word to you, and the result of his word coming to you is that you obey him, that's true faith. So it wasn't because of Abraham's amazing intellect or his earth-shattering wisdom or his energy, his creativity, that he just suddenly started following the Lord. He didn't even know who the Lord was. No, it was by the virtue of the fact of those four words in verse 1, Now the Lord said, God spoke first. And so what is faith? It's not positive thinking. It's not following a hunch. It's not hoping for the best. It's not figuring out and then trying to make it work. It's not a feeling of optimism. It's not believing what you know isn't so. Abraham, when he went out, didn't know where he was going. He didn't know why he was going. He didn't know how he was going to get there. What he did know, he knew whom he was traveling with. And that was enough. You want to know how to really get the most out of this life? Travel with God. You don't have to know where you're headed. You don't have to know the rules. You don't have to know all the particulars. Just follow God. 
by faith. See, the source of all biblical faith is not human will or wisdom. It's the Word of God. In fact, Paul says in Romans 10, 17, he tells us very clearly, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, if your life is dull tonight, if your life is boring or predictable, do what Abraham did. Live by faith. The Word of God will turn monotonous things into momentous things as it did for Abraham. What is faith? Faith is hearing God's Word and running with God. That's what it is, the source for all biblical faith. Second, I want you to see the course of all biblical faith. And you go back to verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. God's saying, Abram, you have to do two things. Number one, you have to apply this faith by coming out. And then you have to apply this faith by going in. You have to come out of where you are to go in where I have you to be. And you know what? That's still true today. How, how can you have biblical faith if you live in habitual sin? It's not possible. God's telling Abraham, by extension, you are an idolater living in idolatry. You are living in habitual and continual sin in your life. If you want to follow me, here's what I need you to do. I need you to come out of that. And I need you to go where I'm telling you to go. Now, here's the thing. You cannot leave the land, or you can't leave for the land of blessing by faith if you continue to live in the land of idolatry and sin. It doesn't work. In Deuteronomy, Moses summarized all of his ministry to Israel uh, a second time. It's Deutero is a word meaning second. Uh, Anomy is the law, second reading of the law. What happens is we're on the backside of Moses' ministry. For 40 years, he's been giving God's law and, and preaching and teaching to a rebellious and stiff-necked people. And here we are 40 years later. Moses is reminding the people about the exodus from Egypt when God delivered them from captivity to freedom. Moses is wanting them to be reminded that God wasn't just bringing them uh, into an escape into the middle of nowhere but that God had a destination. In Deuteronomy 6.23, Moses proclaims, God brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. Do you know the reason why a lot of Christians struggle with true biblical faith is they're not willing to live their own or leave their own personal Ur of the Chaldeans. They're not willing to put Haran in the rearview mirror. What's happening is they want to try to live right where they are in that same old lifestyle, in that same old idolatry, in that stinking thinking, that sin cesspool, and they wonder, why isn't faith working for me? Well, you know, Abraham acted on faith, and he moved out of the land of Haran. There's nothing more stifling or stagnating to faith than unconfessed, unrepent sin held in your heart. You can't have biblical faith if you live in habitual sin and defiance. That's another thing. You want to see through faith, uh, Abraham began following God's word, but he had a choice in the matter. He, he could have acted in faith, which he did, or he could have abstained from acting in faith. And by the way, uh, yes, doing wrong is an obvious act of faithlessness. But so is abstaining from acting in faith. When you just say, well, I know that's what God wants, and instead of rebelling against him, I'm just not going to do it. That's defiance. That's rebellion. And he could have done that. How does the writer of Hebrews say you are to, to act? Well, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, listen to these instructions. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is before us, looking to Jesus. So how do we, how do we get out of our land of sin? 
and get moving toward God? We look to Jesus. How do we do that? We have to lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. There's no way that you can pray or act in faith or do the things that God wants you to do if you are willfully practicing unrepented sin in your heart. Let's say this. You and your spouse are at home and you're having one of the worst arguments you've ever had in your life. And you are saying things to each other. You don't mean them, but they're the most horrific kinds of things. Name calling, accusations, hurtful statements, using past events to club each other over the head. And in the middle of this vicious, nasty, hateful, vindictive fight, because that's what it is. There's no argument here. You are fighting. You hear the baby crying upstairs. And you rush upstairs into the room and you find the baby has a fever and the baby is shaking and shivering. Now, here's the thing. Do you get down on your knees and pray? Don't you feel like a couple of fools to do that? You know you can't pray with that kind of animosity and nastiness and hatefulness. I mean, even the Bible says that husbands live in an understanding way with your wife, that your prayers may be what? Un, in, unhindered. In other words, man, I've always said this to guys. You know, we, we want to hammer on submit. But listen, you talk about unhindered prayers. Let, j- j- don't treat your wife the way Jesus loved the church. And your prayers will be hindered. Same thing here. So what do you do first? James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I want you to notice, James intentionally puts confession, repentance, and prayer first. And then he puts the effect of great power into the fervency, the working power. So we repent first. The source of all biblical faith. The course of all biblical faith. Now let's talk about the rewards. In verses 2 and 3, there are some amazing rewards that God gave Abraham. I want to recount them to you. Number one, God says, I will bless you. Number two, he says, I will bless those who bless you. And conversely with that, he says, I will curse those who curse you. And number three, you will be a blessing to everyone else. God said to Abraham, I will bless you. If you follow me by faith, I will bless you. Do you know that's still true today? It is. If you follow God by faith, he will bless you. How many of you this evening would say, oh, God, please bless me? Oh, God, please bless me. Some of you foolishly say, oh, no, I'm going to be falsely, <laughs> falsely humble, and I don't want God's blessing. <laughs> I'm awful. <laughs> You're awful, all right. <laughs> I want God's blessing. You know, open the windows of heaven and dump it all on me. If, if they don't want theirs, Lord, I'll take it. <laughs> You know, bless me, God. What are we saying? We say, bless me, God. We say, I want you to reward me, Lord. Now, you say, now, Brother Ed, I know you. You're not that good of a guy. Why should the Lord reward you? For the same reason he saved me. Not because I've done anything good, but because he's just a good God. I don't have any merit to be rewarded. But if God's going to hand them out free, hey, I'm getting in line. So we want God to bless us. But how do we make that happen? Hebrews 11.6 says, we don't make that happen. But what it does say is without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. There's the open door to the blessings. You see, by faith, man gives God good pleasure. I don't know how that works. I know that my works are like filthy rags, so that doesn't do anything for God. I can't earn anything. But when I put my faith in him, man, God gets pleasure out of me putting my faith in him. And because of his great love for us, God in his good pleasure gives man good treasure. Jesus said, every good and perfect gift that comes, comes from God above. And so loved ones, hear me. Every blessing, not most not some, not a precious few. Every blessing of God can only be received by biblical faith. That's the only mechanism. Not by works, not by showing God how good you've been. 
God's not Santa Claus. God said to Abraham, I will bless you, and I will also bless them. Now, the problem with many people is they want the kind of faith that is kind of like the Midas touch, right? So here's what we want. We want the things that are self-centered desires. Say, Lord, I want the money. Lord, I want the house. Lord, I want the cars. Lord, I want people to adore me. I want to be seen as someone. But here's the thing. You have to understand how God looks at blessings. God doesn't want to be your river of revival. Or I'm sorry, God wants to be your river of revival, not a reservoir of blessings. That makes sense? River of revival, yes. Reservoir of blessings, no. Now here's, here's what I mean by that. I'm going back to Israel on February 25th. I get to take Noah this time. We are spending three days on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, these bungalow doors just open right up, and you walk maybe a hundred yards, and you are on the shores of the blessed Sea of Galilee. Greatest thing. And the Sea of Galilee reminds me a lot of Lake Cumberland. In fact, if you want to save yourself about $4,000, just go down to Lake Cumberland and take a gander. You've seen the Sea of Galilee. It looks just like that. But I would say there's no place like it on earth. It's rich with fish. It is lush with vegetation. The water smells beautiful. The sight of seeing uh, the Decapolis over into the bottom right-hand corner and the lights and, and looking at uh, Mount Tabor and, and over there at Mount Hermon and, and seeing all the sights. It's amazing to be at Galilee. When I go back there, I know that Galilee is going to be there giving up its water, trickling down through the Jordan River. What a beautiful river that is. I was baptized there the last time I went. I look forward to Noah being baptized, not just because the Jordan is the river Jesus was baptized in, but because the water's 52 degrees. I not want to see his face. I'm kind of sadistic that way. But nonetheless... That water trickles down and and waters the landscape, but it drops to the lowest point on planet Earth, 1,300 feet below sea level, the Dead Sea. It is so low that the water goes in there and it never comes out. And because of that, all the salt that the, the water has gathered along the way, it deposits there. And that water is dank. And it is full of minerals and salt. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea because it holds on to everything it gets. Now here's the thing. What's the difference between the two seas? Well, both receive the same water. But the difference is the Galilee, the Sea of Galilee gives water that it receives. It receives water and it equally gives water. As it receives water, it gives water. But the Dead Sea just collects. And so your life will be a blessing to other people when you think of your blessings not as a reservoir to hoard. My blessings, not yours, my blessings. But you become a river of revival. God blesses you and you hand those blessings on to others And you bless, as God blesses you, you bless others. See, God said to Abraham, I will bless you, I will bless them, and you will be a blessing. But the best promise God gave Abraham in response to his faith is this. Everybody in the entire world is going to be blessed because of you. How many of you all would love to say that tonight? You know what, before I leave this earth... Every single person on planet earth will be blessed because of God working through me. Well, I don't know if you can do that or not because I'm not God. But here's what I do know. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ and share the good news that Jesus Christ saves, God will be a blessing to you and he will be a blessing through you and he will bless others to become born again believers. And you will become a blessing, maybe not to the whole earth, but you could become a blessing to everybody at your workplace. Maybe not the whole of Pulaski County, but maybe you could be the blessing of Science Hill. Maybe not to the whole of the supermarket, 
but maybe the mom and pop down the street. Maybe not all of your neighbors, but maybe your next door neighbors. I guarantee you, if you will share the good news of Jesus Christ, you will be a blessing to all people. Last week we talked about Noah's Ark. A wise man once said this. I wish I would have had this for last week, but he said this. Have you ever thought about what Noah's Ark must have smelled like on the inside? (laughs) I'm talking about, you know, some people say they went two by two. Two by two just describes male and female. There was seven of every clean, 11 of every unclean, or my numbers might be backwards, but that's a lot lot of animals, right? I mean, even Steve Ehrman would have stepped on that boat and took one smell and said, no thanks, I'll drown. (laughs) I'll bet that was the stinkiest boat ever. But that wise man said this as well. You couldn't stand the stench on the inside if it wasn't for the storm on the outside. Ooh, some of us today look at all the troubles in the church of Jesus Christ that men tend to make and we think, I'll just sit it out. I don't need to be a part of a church. If, if they're going to be imperfect, if they're going to fight, if they're going to have problems and gossip and all the rigmarole, I don't want to be a part of the church. Or maybe they'll say, you know, if that's what trusting in Jesus is all about, I don't want any part of that. But I remind you, I'd still rather live in faith in Jesus Christ and be a part of a problematic church than to be caught dead outside of Jesus Christ in the storm of an eternal hell. Tonight I appeal to you, be reconciled to God. No, it's not perfect on earth inside the church, but... You can stand the smell on the inside because of the storm on the outside. And I would invite you today, if you've never trusted in Jesus, to do that now. You say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I come to you by grace through faith. This is not a grace that I myself have discovered. I was an idolater before I met you. Tonight I heard your word and you've called to me through Brother Ed. And now you've given me the source of faith. And I will respond with the course of faith. I will say, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. I confess my sin. And I trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. And I'm going to follow him. Is that your commitment tonight? Maybe that was your commitment tonight before you came in here. So right now I'm going to ask you to just finish out your preparation for the Lord's Supper. Because we're going to do that in just a minute. But for those of you who still are holding on. You know you need to trust in Jesus, but you're still kind of saying, you're circling the airport, not ready to land the plane. What I want for you to do is if you doubt your faith tonight or if you are someone who know you need to trust Jesus, but you're not ready to do it right this moment, I want you to watch what we're about to do. This is called the Lord's Supper. And while you're watching it, I want you to notice the bread and the fruit of the vine. And listen to the words that are coming from Scripture and what they symbolize. And watch when we partake of this together. And when we're done, and then you're ready, we're going to invite you to come forward and trust in the Lord. So turn in your Bibles now to second, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you might want to get your packets ready. If you're a born-again believer, it sounds counterintuitive, but first your cup starts upside down where the bottom portion has that convenient little thumb tab that mine didn't have last time. And you're able to, I would just get it started to where you can open it quickly and just kind of leave it like that. And let me just share with you from the Word of God. Now, the Apostle Paul starts in chapter 11, verse 21, with something that is so very important. We read past it every time. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Don't read past that. If there is nothing else that the Lord's Supper is supposed to do, it is supposed to be received by believers, and it is supposed to be passed on to other believers. 
It is a rite of passage without actually being a rite. It's an ordinance of the church given to us by Christ. Not so we can hoard it, but so we can give it away. So that people will see it. The bread and the vine as the body and blood of Christ. It reminds us we have an evangelical job to do. Not just to receive the Lord's Supper, but to distribute the gospel. So Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Tonight, I will ask Brother Alan Dotson to take his bread and to look toward heaven and to ask blessing on this bread for all of us. And then we'll take it. Brother Alan. Let's take of this symbol of the body of Jesus Christ together. Verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. We open that cup and Paul writes, Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd like to ask our chairman of deacons, Doug Muse, if he would look toward heaven and ask the blessing over this cup as we partake. Amen. Let's take of this symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ together, the new covenant. And now back to you. As we put away the left plastic of the body and blood of Christ, we ask, what about you? Have you trusted in Jesus? You saw his body, his blood, which was broken and shed so that you might know him. It was broken to be divided and given to us, not broken in bone or in flesh, but divided for us that each may have a portion. Have you received Jesus tonight? If you have, let's stand together. And as we sing, we invite you to come forward by faith right now take up thy cross and Ever. 
And praise the Lord. Again, we thank you for being a part of the services today. Once again, if you'd like to contact us or if you've made a decision, please go to the information at the bottom of the screen. You'll see our contact information along with our website. And we look forward to hearing from you. God bless you. And we hope to see you again real soon.